Let's, that's an interesting line. The I am tells me who I am I am because he tells me who I am. When it comes to knowing who you are, who do you listen to? Because we all listen to somebody, don't we? We all listen to somebody for our identity. If it's not Jesus, then our identity will not be, we will not find our true identity. I, I find that such an incredibly powerful line in that song. Because that's where we find out who we are. Because Jesus tells us. Amen? Amen. Good morning. Hmm, it's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. It's so good to be here. Hmm. Hmm. As we are reminded <laughs> almost daily, certainly every time we get together now, we've been working through the book of Acts. And I don't know that we as a church have ever really... Um, been as committed to uh, working our way through a biblical book as we have this particular uh, uh, in this particular season this this particular book I mean we have and I've, I've preached through different books of the Bible but uh, I, I'm not sure about you but but this has been having a profound impact on me and I think it's been having a significant impact on our church I think God is really he's working in our hearts you know, and, and, and I'm so very grateful for that. I'm so very grateful for each one of you. The way that um, you are taking the time to really dive into this. To discover who we are as uh, not only followers of Jesus, but as a church community. Because it's important and, you know, a lot of things are happening. And although... You know, I, one of the things that I appreciate about what Derek reminds us of all the time is that, you know, sometimes we, we, I think as a church, we sort of have an inferiority complex in some ways. Um, I mean, our, our sin should take us to that point. Um, anyway, but uh, because we are a few, we think that that means we can have no impact. But Derek reminds us all the time that Jesus chose 12. And they changed the whole course of human history. Jesus changed history, but they, they allowed that change to impact the world through them. That's probably a better way to put it. And which means that for us as a, uh, you know, not a large gathering, it means that we have the potential to have that same sort of impact in the city of Oakville. Right, a small rudder turns a big ship. Right, and I think we have to remember that, and I think we have to remember and understand that that is exactly what God is preparing us for. And in fact, we are at the precipice of walking into it. We are the small rudder that God is going to use in the city of Oakville. And in the neighborhoods where each of us live, we are the small rudder that will turn the big ship because God has deemed it so. Amen. Amen. God has been showing us some incredibly remarkable things, I think, as we've gone through the book of Acts. Right? We've been, we've been, he's confronted us in a lot of ways. He's confronted us with the reality of who the church really is and how the church is to function. He's been confronting us with, with some 
with some, well, I mean, they're good things, right? They're things that we sort of know, but God's been really impressing upon our hearts, hasn't he? Right? He, one, one of the things that he has really been impressing upon our hearts is the, is the fact that we need to continually ask ourselves about what is our relationship to Jesus' church? Right? That's a hard one. That's a hard one for modern, independent people, isn't it? But we've been going through this, and, and, and God has been challenging us to consider and evaluate and maybe reconsider what is our actual relationship to his church. Right? It, we've, we've, we've seen how the church is supposed to be organized. And most importantly, we are continually being confronted by the profound reality of who is at the center of this Holy Spirit-formed salvation community. It's Jesus. It has to be Jesus. We have to continually, continually, <clears throat> and, this, and this, is a, this is a part of human nature, isn't it? Because we like to put ourselves at the center of things. And God is challenging us to say, you got to get yourself out of there and put Jesus back where he belongs. Jesus is the center of my church. And it's hard for us. It's hard for us because that's who we are as sinful human beings. We desire to be at the center of everything. Hmm. Right, the book of Acts, and, and in fact, the, the entire New Testament, what we see at the, at the heart of the church, the heart of the church that has an impact in the world, has an impact in its culture, what we see is the life-defining, holy and righteous, living Jesus Christ. That's who's at the center of the church. That's who's at the center of the church on mission. Churches that are on mission, they change things. Because the first thing to change is the heart of the church. It's our hearts. And that, more than anything else is what God has been doing and God has been confronting us with. That it is our hearts that have to change first. If we want to be a church that has an impact, then first our hearts have to change, right? That's what we talk about. We talk about revival. And when we talk about revival, it's not about them changing, it's about us changing first. It has to be us changing first. Because if it's not about us, if it's not about our hearts being changed, if it's not about our hearts being transformed by Jesus, then there is nothing that, of value that we have to offer this world. Nothing. The only good thing we have to offer is Jesus. The only good thing that we have to offer is the love that he has offered us. And so more than anything else, Jesus has continued to ask us to ask ourselves the question, who is really in charge here? Who is really in charge of this church? And I'm, you know what, and if we're honest there, we would say, well, you know what, Jesus, I, I think there's times where we let you be in charge, but there's more times where we want to be in charge. Right? And, and, and of that we repent. That we repent of. And so... This is us, friends. This is us, the, the beautiful but messed up and yet still being sanctified. Bride of Christ, born of the Holy Spirit. Being called to live out the divine gospel 
of Jesus Christ in love and in truth in front of a broken and hurting world. This is us. Messed up. Beautiful. Being sanctified. Bride of Christ. Living out the gospel. This beautiful gospel of Jesus Christ in front of a broken and hurting world. That's who we are. And if we are true to who God is making us to be, then we will have an impact in the world. Right? There, our calling, our calling now is the same as the calling the church has had since Pentecost. And that is to be devoted to the apostles' teaching in community. To be devoted to the breaking of bread in community. To be devoted to fellowship in community. And to be devoted to prayer in community together. To bring the love of Jesus to this world through the community. And all of it accomplished by the divine power of God in the person of the Holy Spirit. Which gives power. Which gives power to this community. This church, hmm, whew, this church is powered by the Holy Spirit. If Jesus is at the center of this church, it will be powered by the Holy Spirit. And it doesn't matter whether we are few or many, there will be nothing to stop the gospel from going out from this church. Because we are powered by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is power. The person of the Holy Spirit, alive, is power. And he will change things. If we let him, he will change us. If we let him, he will change Oakville. He will change Hamilton. He will change Burlington. He will change Guelph. He will change this province. He will change this country. He will change this world. Because the Holy Spirit is power. Hmm. And isn't that the point? Isn't that the point? We, we've seen in Acts this progression. Right? Of the gospel moving out from Jerusalem and Judea to Samaria. And then to the ends of the earth. Right? When we're, in a few weeks, we'll get to chapter 13, and we're going to start looking at the missionary journeys of Paul as he takes the message beyond sort of the borders where it was. He takes the, the, the message of the gospel to the known world. And one of, the, one of the things that is quite amazing is how the gospel invades the very heart of power in the world in those days. Rome. Right now, it wasn't Paul that planted the church, but the gospel invades the very heart of power. And the reason is because the Holy Spirit is a greater power. Right? No matter what kind of power men think they have, humanity, and I'm talking men and women, because we all want power these days. Right? That's what we're all about. We're about power. Right? But the Holy Spirit's power is greater. No power of man can stand against the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we see the power, the, the, the gospel invades Rome. And this is important for us to understand. This is important because we need to consider this because it's very easy for us to take a look around at humanity these days and go, oh man, it's too broken, it's too messed up. We live in this pluralistic society where everybody has a God and everybody's doing their own thing. What hope is there for the gospel? We take a look at the city of Oakville and the, and the, and the subdivision, the neighborhoods around us, and we go, what hope? Everybody is... Everybody's got a God. Whether it's a religious God that, that they, they see, they go to, to worship somewhere, or it's their money God or their power God. 
Everybody, and we live in this pluralistic society. What hope is there? But when we, when we understand that Rome was just as pluralistic a society then and just as messed up then as our world is and our society is now, we say, wow, there is hope because the Holy Spirit is a greater power than any power in this world. And so we say there's hope. And you know how we know there's hope? Because God has kept his church planted right in the middle of it. Right in the middle of this messed up pluralistic society full of messed up people trying to figure out what it means to follow Jesus. But the Holy Spirit power will leave this place and transform the city of Oakville, this pluralistic city of Oakville, if we keep Jesus at the center of this church. That's what the hope is when we read about how the gospel moves out from Jerusalem. It moves out into these places of power, the seat of power of the known world, and it completely changes it. The gospel completely changes Rome. Do you realize that? It means that the gospel will completely change Oakville. The gospel will completely change Oakville. If there was no hope of that, the church wouldn't be here. And that's the reality. So friends, we're going to continue in Acts this morning. We're in, at Acts chapter 11. So if you open your Bibles, and I am going to read the first uh, 18 verses of Acts chapter 11. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. The apostles and the brothers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, he, uh, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, You went into the house of an uncircumcised man and ate with them? Peter began and explained everything to them precisely as it had happened. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. I saw something like a large sheet being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to where I was. I looked into it, and I saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, reptiles, and birds of the air. Then I heard a voice telling me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. I replied, Surely not, Lord. Nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth. The voice spoke from heaven a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times. And then it was pulled up to heaven again. Right then and there, uh, right then, three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea stopped at the house where I was staying. The Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them. These six brothers also went with me and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen an angel appear in his house and say, Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He will bring you a message through which you and all your household will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us at the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord had said. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift as he gave us, who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could oppose God? When they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, So then God has granted even the Gentiles repentance unto life. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> this is an extension of chapter 10, isn't it? It's, it, is, it is Paul, or excuse me, Peter, explaining to the church what had happened. And so we, we revisit, as Peter revisited chapter 10 a little, uh, a little bit, so that we can understand just what an actual, how monumental, there's a good word, how monumental an event this was, right, that, that, that a group of Gentiles were now included in the kingdom of God. And we need to understand the sort of the Jewish Christian mindset 
and why this messed with them so badly. How it was that, that Peter, an observer of the law, <clears throat> how it was that he could enter the house of a Gentile. Right? And, not, and it wasn't just for a few moments. It wasn't like he popped in and popped out. Right? He's, well, you, you know, God told me to go, but I don't want anybody else to know that I was there. It's not like he kind of went around the back, right? And, and had a look around and said, oh, well, nobody's watching. I can go in. That's not what happened. He didn't just spend a couple of minutes. He spent a few days there. We have to understand what a momentous event this is, that the Gentiles, that they not only came to faith in Jesus, but they had received the Holy Spirit, just as the Jewish Christians had, and just as the Samaritans had. Like, this is huge. If you are a Jewish Christian, this is massive, and this, this hurts the brain. Right? Remember last week we talked about those God boxes, about how we, everything that we think we understand about God, how we put it in this box, and, that, and that's how we understand God, and we put a top on it, right? Well, understand the Jewish Christians, they've got their own God box. And yes, they believe in Jesus, but their, their view and understanding is still limited, what did we say last week? That no matter how big and how mature we think we are, and no, no matter how big our, our, our idea of God is, it will always be too small. And that's what we see here. And, and, and for us, sometimes I think we, we don't understand how big a deal this is because we, we read these things in our Bibles Right, and we, and we hear them talked about, but they don't shake us the way they should. Right? We should be shaken by the reality of, of this, but they don't. And I think there's a couple of reasons for that. First of all, 2,000 years have passed, and, and we have become familiar with the stories. And the more familiar with things we become, the less they, they shake us. Right? But not only that, 2,000 years have passed and the majority of new converts to Christianity are not Gentiles. Right? The, the, major, excuse me, the majority um, are Gentiles. They're not Jewish. In fact, it's more outstanding to us when we hear of someone Jewish accepting Jesus. Not Gentiles. Because that's, well... Everybody who comes to faith mostly is a Gentile, just like us, right? So it doesn't shake us. Second, another reason is that it doesn't really seem like a big deal to us is that we don't understand the significance of the temple. And this is really the heart of the story. The reason we aren't shaken by the reality of this, the way the Jewish Christians, and especially the circumcision group, because they're shaken, friends, by this story. They're shaken by this reality. But the reason that we aren't is because we don't understand the temple. We don't understand the significance of the temple, the way the original Jewish Christians understood it. And that Right, when the Holy Spirit fell on the Gentiles. See, friends, here's, here's the reality. When the Holy Spirit fell on the Gentiles, the Jewish Christians understand that all of the relationships they had in their life changed forever. Every single relationship they had changed forever when the Holy Spirit fell on the Gentiles. And this is what shook them so badly. Right? Their relationship with God changed forever their relationship with each other changed forever and their relationships with the rest of the world changed forever that's significant friends 
For most of us, when we hear the word temple, what we think about, we, we think about a building, right? We think perhaps about, you know, if, if we've been reading the Bible, we think about Solomon's temple, right? The way that it was beautifully adorned, you know, or the temple, the second temple, the temple in the time of Jesus, which was the rebuilt temple, but then it was jazzied up, right, by Herod the Great. Perhaps we just, we don't think even in, in sort of the, the biblical terms, in, in, the, in the terms of the, the biblical temple, we think just in terms of buildings, perhaps ornate in nature, with golden domes on the corners, or maybe a golden dome in the middle, or maybe both. Right? We, we think of, of places where some sort of religious rituals or ceremonies take place. That's, that's kind of how we as modern people think about temples. These days, we especially are more likely to associate temples with Islam or Buddhism or the Sikh religion. That, that's a reality because we just don't really understand or take to heart what temple is. But friends, the ancients understood the ancients understood what the temple was, right? And they didn't understand it the way we do, right? And it's not, the way we understand the temple now is not the way the Bible teaches us to understand the temple. And, and, and unless we get this right, we will continue to miss the bigger significance of who we are in Christ Jesus as his church. That's why that song was so important. I am who I am because the I am says who I am. That's important. That's important. When we understand what the temple is, it will completely transform our relationship with everything, just as it did with those Jewish Christians. We have been watching the church spread out, guided by the Holy Spirit. God has used the persecution of the church to move the message of the gospel out of Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria, and, and to the end, we're watching it now go to the ends of the earth. And we talked about this last week, didn't we? It was a really big deal that the Gentiles were included in the faith. So this is news that spreads quickly. Remember, Peter doesn't go in by the back door and just kind of pop in and pop out. Peter goes in the front door. He's in the front door. Everybody sees it. Everybody knows that he's there. He's there not just for a moment. He's there for a few days. The town is buzzing. Not only is Caesarea buzzing, but everywhere is buzzing. This gets back to Jerusalem. This, this news travels it couldn't have traveled faster if Twitter and, and Instagram were a thing back then. That's how fast this news traveled. Right? This is a big deal. And the news spread quickly. So when Peter and the other believers, when they got back from their trip uh, to Caesarea and visiting Cornelius and his family and his friends, their initial instinct was to go to the church and to share, right? To testify, to testify about what God had done. That's, I, I appreciate so much my brother Glenn. Pastor, we have to testify. We've got to testify about what God is doing. Amen, amen, right? We have to. This, do you remember in chapter 4, Peter and John, they were released from prison. What did they do? They didn't go say, hey, listen, you know what, I'm hungry. Let's, let's go grab a bite. Let's sit and talk about it together, about what happened to us. No! What did they do? They went back to the church to tell the brothers and sisters what had gone on, what God was doing. Right? So, again, this is, this is what's going on here. Peter goes back to Jerusalem. Everybody knows what's going on. What does he do? He goes to testify. This is the goodness of God. This is what God is doing. Right? This, my friends, is how the mission of the church works. 
We are sent out by Jesus from the body on mission. And we don't go out by ourselves. We don't go out by ourselves. We go with brothers and sisters. Peter took six brothers with him. We go out on mission because we are sent by Jesus on mission. And then we return to testify to what God is doing. Not what we're doing. What God is doing. This, is, this builds, this edifies the church. This, my friends, is what Jesus taught the church to do. Luke chapter 10. We read about Jesus sending out 72 disciples to share, to share the message. And then in verse 17, we read this. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. They're sent out together in pairs, not by themselves, but they're sent out and then they return and they testify. That's how it's supposed to work, friends. It's what Jesus desires of his church. His church to be able to celebrate what God is doing in this world. If only, you know, friends, if only... We advertised what God is doing the way Satan advertises what he's doing. Can you imagine? God is doing so much more in this world. And yet all we ever hear about is the evil. That's because the church doesn't testify. They returned and they testified. So Peter and the other Christians, they returned to Jerusalem and they testified to the church that the Gentiles have received the same promise from God of the Holy Spirit when they believed the gospel that they had. But, whoa, <laughs> oh man, this, this, caused, this caused the Jewish Christians, right? Especially the circumcision group, man, this caused them some consternation. They were puckering hard. It was like they had just sucked on a real lemon. Oh, what do you mean? This was causing them, <laughs> it caused them pain. And so they grilled Peter about the validity of their mission to the Gentiles. And the text says, so when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, you went into the house of, an uns of uncircumcised men and ate with them? Not the first thing that comes out of their mouth is, glory to God, they believed. They were like, oh man, you went into their house. And you ate with them. What were you doing? Not, praise God. Hmm. You didn't follow the rules. <laughs> right? This, this isn't just a question, right? It's an accusation. We know that. It's an accusation because if this happened, and the Holy Spirit really did come on the Gentiles then the cataclysmic claim of Jesus that he came to bring life to everyone who accepts his loves changes everything about the way these circumcised uh, Christians changes everything about the way they have to view the whole world. Right? And they get it. They, uh, that's what they knew. That's what they knew. Right? The circumcision group. Right? We're gonna, they're all through the New Testament. We read about them all through, like Paul goes up against them time and time and time again. Right? They had this head knowledge, but not the heart knowledge. They understood the message with their head, but they didn't know it with their hearts yet. Just like some of us, just like some of us here today, some of us understand the truth. Enough to say that we are Christians, but we still don't know the joy of God's grace. It's the difference between knowing with your head, or understanding with your head, and knowing, knowing Jesus with your heart. And the reason for this is because of the temple. Tim Keller says the temple in ancient times was understood as the place where heaven and earth 
where the eternal and temporal, where the supernatural and the natural came together and met. <clears throat> it's where the divine resided, and it was the place where the presence of the divine was mediated. And this is important, friends, because this is the true purpose of the temple. Right? Mediated means that the gap between the glory of God and the sin of humanity is bridged. In other words, the temple is the place where all of the supernatural mysteries of the world come into focus and are mediated into one ultimate reality. This is the temple. And friends, ancient people understood it way better than we do today. They actually have a better or had a better grasp on this than we do, than us so-called modern people do today. Right? We are too sophisticated to think in these terms. Ancient people knew that there was an ultimate reality and an ultimate glory that they couldn't themselves quite grasp hold of without the gap being closed for them. That's what they understood, and that's what we miss. Today we believe that there is a reasonable explanation for everything, right? That science or reason, right, can, can explain everything. But that just isn't the case. There is a divine glory that can't be explained away by science or reason. There just is. Humanity has always sought this divine glory and this ultimate reality and has worked since the very beginning, since sin entered the world, at devising plans to bridge this chasm between itself and the divine glory, the, the ultimate reality that is God. Right? And this, this man-made design of bridging the gap is called <clears throat> religion. Because that's what religion does. It's man's self-centered attempt to bridge the gap between us and the divine glory of God. Remember, that's what we talked about last week. We defined religion last week as the way in which we as human beings seek to control God by our actions. In other words, we are trying to grab hold of the ultimate glory of God through what we do. We are trying to manipulate the gap between ourselves and the glory of God, not for his benefit, but for ours, that's religion. That's what man has been trying to do all, all, since sin. Remember, God rescued the Israelites from slavery. And they, and they built a tabernacle. God gave Moses the, the plans and the design. And they built a tabernacle. And it was... The portable temple. It was literally, literally where heaven and earth met. It was literally the residing place of God. His Shekinah glory present on earth. Then the story moves. The, the journey moves on and we see the, 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 the people of God, they have a land and they desire to build a permanent temple. And so in 2 Chronicles 7, after Sol Solomon prays to dedicate this temple that uh, they built to God, we read this. When Solomon finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. The priests could not enter the temple of the Lord because the, because the glory of the Lord filled it. When all the Israelites saw the fire coming down and the glory of the Lord above the temple, they knelt on the pavement with their faces to the ground and they worshipped and gave thanks to the Lord saying, He is good, His love endures forever. The presence of God, friends, I, I need to, we've got to get this. We need to get this. The presence of God was so powerful that when God filled the temple, the priests were shaken and couldn't even go near it. The, 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 the glory of God, the presence of God was so powerful that nobody could get near the temple. It shook them so bad, the priests couldn't stand on their, on their feet. 
When, friends, let me ask this. When was the last time the glory of God knocked us off our feet? It should knock us off our feet every single day when we think about it. Because that's who God is. My dear friends, the glory of God, the divine glory of God is what we as human beings know that we are separated from and instinctively yearn to be, long, be, be close to. Right? We know it. We know it somewhere deep inside of us. And we yearn to be close to the glory of God. We yearn for it. There's uh, C.S. Lewis. Most of you have heard of C.S. Lewis. He, uh, he gave a sermon called The Weight of Glory. And in this sermon he said, The sense that in this universe we are treated as strangers. The longing to be acknowledged, to meet with some response, to bridge some chasm that yawns between us and reality is part of our inconsolable secret. We yearn. We yearn to be close to this glory. This world, this world treats us as strangers. And yet there is a reality, and, and, our, and somewhere deep inside of us, we, we know this, that there is a reality beyond, beyond what we can comprehend that is seeking us. And we long to be a part of it. We long to be close to it. We long to be shaken by the glory of God. Friends, the temple is the ultimate reality where heaven meets earth. It is everything that we as human beings long for. It is what we desire to be next to. Our desperation is for the ultimate truth. It is our, as Lewis says, our inconsolable secret. And this is what the Israelites understood better than we do now about the temple. <clears throat> this is what the circumcised Christians understood that we don't get now. The temple wasn't just about making meaningless sacrifices. It was the very president, presence of the ultimate reality. And so it is where they went to close the distance between themselves and the presence of God. To offer sacrifices in order to bridge the gap. In order to have the ultimate reality divinely appointed in their lives. That's the point. That's the temple. If we don't understand the significance of this, we will never know the true worth of our Lord and Savior Jesus. And we need to understand its significance if we are truly going to know who we are in Christ. Because here's the deal. Along comes Jesus. And look at what he says about himself. He says, I am the temple. My body is the temple. I am the ultimate reality. I am the meeting of heaven and earth, the eternal and the temporal, the supernatural and the natural. I am the ultimate reality that every human heart longs for. I am the inconsolable secret that you long for. I am the Shekinah glory that came down in a blaze of fire and filled the temple. I am the glory. I am the glory that knocks you off your feet. I am the glory. I am the glory that sends you to your knees. I am the glory. I am the glory that shakes the mountain and shakes the room when you pray. I am all of this and even more. That's what Jesus says about who he is. This is, friends, this is what all of the New Testament writers are pointing us to. Right? In John chapter 1, the writer says, And the word became flesh and dwelt, dwelt among, among us. We have seen his glory and the glory of the one and only Son. Dwelt. The word dwelt there means tabernacled. It means temple. 
The word became flesh and templed among us. In Colossians 2.9, the Apostle Paul says, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. All the fullness of where heaven meets earth is in Christ Jesus. The whole Old Testament, it points to Jesus as the ultimate reality. And the whole New Testament shows us Jesus as the ultimate reality. Right? But, but Jesus' claim is even bolder. It's bolder. Because he says, in my temple, not only am I the glory, but I am the one who fills the gap between you and the ultimate reality that you seek. I am the ultimate reality, and I am the bridge to the ultimate reality. That's what he meant when he said, destroy this temple, and it will be raised in three days. Friends, Jesus died on the cross for the forgiveness of sins and was raised to life in three days. Jesus is the bridge. He is the ultimate sacrifice, the once and for all offering, so that whoever believes in him will themselves not perish, but will have everlasting life in him. Do you see, friends, can you see how this is so mind-boggling? Jesus says, my kingdom is the heavenly kingdom and I am the ultimate glory everyone seeks. But wait, what, he says, what makes my temple so different from every other temple there is, every other temple on earth, every other kingdom on earth, what makes his temple so different is in all those other temples you have to bring sacrifices. In every other temple you have to do the work to bridge the gap. In every other temple there is a human priest. He says, but in my temple I am the sacrifice. I do the work. I am the priest. I am not only the God on the other side of the gap. I fill the gap. I am the way across the gap. And all you have to do is receive me. That's what Jesus says. That is the claim of Jesus. Do you see, friends, why the circumcision group had such a hard time thinking that the Gentiles could be part of the kingdom of heaven? The Jewish believers understood very well that this new reality mean that they didn't want, they didn't want to accept it. Because in their mind, Jesus... Being God, yes, they got that, but he was still the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He was still exclusively their God. Not the God of these unclean Gentiles. He was, he was their God. Right? So in their finite minds, in order to be Christians, the Gentiles first had to become Jews. They kind of had to convert to convert. So Peter, he continues to tell them the story of what happened that day at Cornelius' house and how the Holy Spirit came on the Gentiles. And he says, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us at the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift he has given us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? Hmm. It's the God boxes, right? It's the God boxes that we talked about last week. The moment Peter said this, I, I, I got to believe that the God boxes of all of the circumcision group must have just exploded. Right, all of, the, all of the duct tape came off and the nails came flying out and the lid, it just burst off. Because in that moment, everything changed for them. Everything changed for them. And it changes for us. It changes everything for us. And so we have to ask ourselves, what are the implications <clears throat> right? What are the implications? What were the implications for, for the circumcised Christians, the Jewish Christians? And then what are the implications for us today as the local church trying to be faithful to the calling of the local church? Well, the first thing is that when, when we really understand what's happening here and the, 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 the Holy Spirit coming down on the Gentiles... First thing that happens is it changes our relationship with God. It changed the relationship of God of those Jewish Christians. And when we understand this, it changes 
our relationship with God. Second thing that we need to understand is that it changes our relationship with each other. And the third thing is that it changes our relationship with our neighbors. First thing, it changes our relationship to God. Now, <clears throat> it's, I, I, it's, it's amazing to me how much this comes up in different ways in the book of Acts. Right? Do you remember what we said last week about who a Christian is? A Christian is someone who knows deep down that they do not deserve any good thing from God, but also knows that in Jesus Christ they have received all of the inheritance of the kingdom of heaven. That's who a Christian is. Somebody who knows that they are filthy rags, and yet they are adorned in beautiful robes. That we know that we are a sinful people, and yet we know that our sin in Jesus Christ has been forgiven. That's who a Christian is. The thing then that defines us is the relationship that we have with Jesus. And this terrified the Jewish Christians. If the Gentiles were now part of the kingdom <clears throat> and they didn't have to be Jewish first, what did that say then about their religion? What it meant is that they actually had to start relating to God the way the Gentiles did. And that was by grace. Right? That's what it means. It means that, that their religion was worthless. That they had to relate to God through grace. Not performance. Not by the external defining mark of circumcision. But being, and not by being able to trace their lineage back to Abraham, but through the internal circumcision of the heart that only comes by the Holy Spirit through faithful submission to God's grace. The Apostle Paul in Romans 2, he talks about the value of circumcision. He says in verse 28 and 29, A person is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one outwardly, Inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart, by the spirit, not by the written code. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. The true value of circumcision is not the outward mark, but the inward transformation that comes when the Holy Spirit comes alive in each one of God's children. That's why Jesus says, that his temple is not a temple where you can earn any, award, any rewards. Because the moment that you enter, not by your doing, but by his, you receive everything and more that God has promised through his Holy Spirit. The moment that you enter Jesus' temple, you are going to receive and experience his presence and love and the profound joy that Jesus has for each one of his children. <clears throat> It's utterly astounding <clears throat> how often God deals with the reality of how performance-based we as human beings are. We are performance-based. Even if we don't think we are, that's the way we live. Oh, but over and over again, we are reminded just how religious we are and how we need a new relationship with God. It's why, friends, two people <clears throat> can be sitting in this very sanctuary on any given Sunday morning, singing the same worship songs, listening to the same sermon, and yet be in two different temples. One person still looking to perform, looking for recognition, wanting to be seen, worshiping in order to get something from God, praying in order to exercise control over God. The other person finding their complete joy, their hope, their identity and salvation in Jesus. Worshipping and praying not to get something from God, but to give themselves to God. One person looking to tra transform God into their image. 
the other wanting to be transformed into the image of their Savior Jesus. One person desperate to be accepted and the other longing to allow the gospel to penetrate ever deeper into their very being and life so as to reflect the grace and glory of their Savior. <clears throat> what temple, friends, each of us has to ask this question, what temple am I worshiping in this morning? Jesus says, if you come to my temple, the relationship you have with me is going to be intimate. It's going to be personal. It's going to be relational. And you are going to feel the love I have for you in your life. All right? And that leads us to the second point, which is that when we understand the implications of the temple, it changes our relationship with each other. Right? And this really terrified the Jewish Christians. If our relationship with God is relational and intimate and personal, then our relationship with each other as brothers and sisters can't be anything else other than relational and intimate and personal. <clears throat> can, you, can you imagine what this did to the circumcision group? As brothers and sisters in Christ, they are now in the same relationship with the Gentiles as they are with other Jewish Christians. But this is the point, isn't it, friends? This is the point of the kingdom of heaven. Paul in Galatians 3 says, So in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ, right? In other words, who have received the Holy Spirit, have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor there is male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. <clears throat> Not only are the Gentiles equal with the Jewish Christians in Christ, the Gentiles are actually now who the Jewish Christians always claim to be. And they are the heirs of Abraham's seed. You see, friends, for all of the talk of being related to Abraham, the only true people of God that there has ever been are those who are related to Abraham through faith. And have trusted God by faith. Those are always and have always been the true descendants of Abraham. It's never been about lineage. It's always been about an, a lineage of faith. Of which the Gentiles are now included. Right? <clears throat> and what this means for us is that the way we are in relationship with each other in the church. Says a lot about what temple we're worshipping in. If we, come, <clears throat> if we come to the temple of works and performance, we won't ever realize the beauty and the true... Uh, we will if we come into the temple of works and performance, we will never understand the true beauty of the family of God. And we will never understand and see the true beauty of each other. And we will never experience peace because we will always be trying to prove our worth. We will always be trying to prove ourselves. We will ne it will never be intimate and personal and relational. We will never be in relationships within the family of God. Because the truth is we can't be personal and intimate and relational with Jesus. Right? The way we are with other people. And I know this is hard for some of us. I know it's hard for some of us to be, to be intimate and personal. But if our... The intimacy and, the, and how personal we are with the family of God says everything about how actually personal and intimate we are with Jesus. We can't be personal and intimate with one and not be personal and intimate with the other. We can't claim to be personal and intimate with Jesus and not be personal and intimate with our church family. But if we come into the temple of God's divine grace, we will come to the church with, it, with the understanding of family. A family that lives and eats and prays and studies together. A family that is radically generous with its resources towards one another. A family that shares the highs and the lows of life with each other. A family that goes on mission together and then testifies together to what God is doing. 
If you come to this temple, then you have come to the temple of Jesus, knowing that you have nothing of value to offer except the love that you have received from Jesus. Right? And, and it's in that place, then, that we start to naturally gravitate towards the fellowship of other family members, of other members in the church. And then spending time in the presence of God with the family of God becomes a priority for us. Which leads us to the last point today, friends. And that understanding this changes our relationship with our neighbors. I want, to, I want us to turn to Isaiah chapter 56. If you have your Bibles, and I want to read verses 4 to 8 this morning. <clears throat> Starting at verse 4, Isaiah 56 says, For this is what the Lord says to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose what pleases me, and hold fast to my covenant. To them I will give within my temple and its walls a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will endure forever. And foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord to minister to him to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants. All who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it and who hold fast to my covenant. These I will bring uh, to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifice, sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. The sovereign Lord declares, he who gathers the exiles of Israel, I will gather still others to them beside those already gathered. <clears throat> Friends, do you know what this means? It means that God's kingdom has always been for everyone who comes to God because God has always been gathering the outsiders and the outcasts, the marginalized, and the well-to-do. God has always been gathering to himself everyone whose hearts are pointed towards God who have that inconsolable longing for the glory and the presence of the Lord. God's kingdom has always, God's kingdom has never been exclusive to the Israelites. It has never been exclusive. It is for everyone. It's for everyone whose hearts long for the glory of God. When we come to God by grace in Jesus Christ, we are coming to the temple to which everyone has always been welcomed by grace. But it is also means that God's kingdom has never been a kingdom of pride or injustice or self-righteousness. It means that as disciples of Jesus, we can't look down on anyone, <clears throat> excuse me, can't look down on anyone because one day they may be brothers and sisters in Christ, just as the Gentiles became brothers and sisters of those Jewish Christians. There is nobody that we can look down on because one day they may be our brothers and sisters. All right, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's an incredible thought. Understanding this changes our relationship with our neighbors. And there's another amazing thing about this is that when you become a Christian, Peter writes in 1 Peter 2, 4 to 5, that you are being made yourself into a temple. As you come to him, the living stone rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. Peter says that, if Jesus, the living stone, is the temple, that when, then, when, uh, then when we respond to his love, we are also being built into temples. The same temple as Christ. Because in Jesus, we become the temple of the Holy Spirit, who is equally with Jesus, the ultimate reality where heaven meets earth, where the eternal and the temporal, where the supernatural and the natural meet, where the divine rides, ri resides in the presence of the divine is mediated. If we take seriously our calling as the church, this is who we are and who we are being made to be. And it means that we need to care deeply for the well-being of our neighbors and our neighborhood because <clears throat> excuse me, all are equally precious to Jesus. 
When Peter had finished testifying to what God had done, there was only one possible response from the church, from the Jewish Christians, from the circumcised Christians. The text says, when they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, so then even the Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. Friends, the beautiful part of this text is that the church, although it had questions and accusations, the church was in one accord. Because the text doesn't say <clears throat> that some went away mad and some went away angry and some threw up their hands and some, you know, did this and did that. And it says they praised God. It says they praised God. They praised God together. And friends, here's the bottom line. When the church is in one accord, when it is found unity, when it is seeing the goodness of God, when it knows who it is, you know that you are in the right temple. Let us pray. Oh, gracious God and Heavenly Father, uh, we give you thanks for this day. Lord Jesus, you are, hmm, you are the ultimate reality. You are the, the inconsolable secret that we all seek. You are the divine glory that shakes us. And you are the one who bridged the gap so that we can come boldly to the kingdom to your kingdom, to your everlasting kingdom. Help us not to reside in a kingdom of, of works, uh, in a kingdom of self-righteousness, but help us to reside in your kingdom. Help us to live in and through and by your grace. Help us to have the kind of relationship with God that, that we need to have with God. We pray, Lord, that that knowing and understanding this deeper, it will change all of the relationships in our life, that it will change the relationship with our neighbors and with each other so that we may all um, testify to your goodness and help others know uh, the beauty and the grace and the love and the mercy and the hope that is found in the divine kingdom of Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.